again, my dear brothers and sisters, shall we pray? We ask you, Father in heaven, to come and visit with each and every one of us, to give each one of us understanding that when we come to the end of this sermon, may we be drawn closer to you than never before because we ask and pray in the name of Jesus, amen. Today I'm reading from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and reading verse 7. Bible says, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. For God loves a cheerful giver. The title is, Why Does God Love Cheerful Givers? Why Does God Love Cheerful Givers? It is important, therefore, for us to look at this phrase, God loves a cheerful giver. Why doesn't he like the gift? Why does the Bible say he loves a cheerful giver? Why doesn't he give credit to everyone who gives something to him? Why does he single out cheerful givers? There are several characteristics of cheerful givers that I want to share with you. Number one, they know who the real owner is. They know who the real owner is. They do not dispute what the Bible says. Because Psalm number 24, stanza 1, the Bible declares, the earth and everything in it, the world and the inhabitants belong to me. The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants belong to the Lord. And so a cheerful giver knows that everything in the world belongs to God. And because they know that everything belongs to him, they give cheerfully to him because he is the rightful owner. A story is told of one man who gave his friend to look after his cattle. And from time to time, this owner would go to the friend's place and he would always pick the best animal. And on two occasions, he picked the best bulls. And this friend who was keeping his animals was fed up and he always got annoyed when the owner of the cattle would take one of the best bulls. One day, this friend who was keeping the cattle of uh, another person also had some chickens. But where he was uh, staying, there were a lot of wild animals and birds of prey which uh, killed many of his chickens. And, to, and so he took some of his chickens to his friend to take care of them. So one day he was visited. And these were distinguished visitors. He didn't have anything to entertain them with. And so he thought of the chickens that he had taken to his friend's place. And so he went there. And when he went there, the friend was there. And so he told the children uh, to chase around the biggest cock that was there. And when the friend was keeping the chickens, so that that biggest uh, cock was caught and the owner was going to kill it. He was very annoyed. He even proposed to the owner of the chickens that why can't I give you another chicken so that I keep this cock because I am going to have a good breed of chickens. And the owner said, no, this is the best I have that I am to entertain my uh, visitors or guests with. The friend keeping the chickens was very annoyed. And so this guy... The owner of the chickens, as he was traveling back home, he spoke to himself. Why did that man get annoyed when I was just getting what belongs to me? They are not his chickens. He doesn't know how I, I took time and resources to make sure that I have the chickens. He is just chicken, keeping them for me. He, he is not the owner. Why is he so annoyed? Little did he know. That when he would reach home, he will find the owner of the cattle he was keeping waiting for him. 
When he arrived home, the owner of the kettle he was keeping said, Thank God you have arrived in time. I was almost going to the crowd to get one cow so that I can go and slaughter it, sell them the meat so that I can take care of my needs. But one thing had changed. The gentleman who was always annoyed when the owner of the kettle came and got that which he wanted, this time around he was not annoyed. He remembered what the other friend of his had done to him. This time he was cheerful. The reason is he had known that this is the rightful owner and the owner had the right to everything that he has and to everything that he claims as his own. My dear brothers and sisters, we will never be cheerful givers as long as we don't recognize God as the real owner of everything that is here on earth. Because the, uh, the verse that we read said God is the owner not only of the earth, not only of everything in it, but even us, you and me, are not of our own. We were bought at a price. We were created by God in his own image. And so he claims ownership of us. And so cheerful givers, they give cheerfully because they know who the real owner is. Number two, cheerful givers value their partnership with God. They value their partnership with God. You know, my brothers and sisters, whenever God wanted to do something, in this world in the past, he always used human beings even when he had all power in heaven and on earth to do everything. He can command and everything would be done. But nevertheless, he always uses people. Before the flood came to the antediluvian world, he used Noah to partner with him in warning people of the coming flood. To establish a people for himself, he used Abraham and called him from wherever he was to a place that he had designated for him. When he was delivering his people from Egypt, he partnered with Moses, though he had difficult with speech, and yet God made him to be eloquent. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters, when God wanted the city of Nineveh to be warned, he had to use Jonah to go and witness to a foreign nation. Yes, brothers and sisters, when God also wanted to prepare the way for Jesus to come, he used John the Baptist, the voice in the wilderness. And when God wanted reformation in the world, he used Martin Luther. And when God wanted the message of the soon coming of Jesus to be preached on a larger scale, he used William Miller and all the Millerite friends. Yes, my brothers and sisters, God always partners with human beings to accomplish his mission here on earth. He can do anything without us. He is not dependent on us. My dear brothers and sisters, we should ever keep in mind that God is not dependent on us. When um, Balaam misbehaved, what did God do? He used a donkey to speak. And he was telling him that, you know, Bach, if you are a Balaam, if you are not able to do my job, I can even command this dumb animal to do the work that you are failing to do yourself. And we know again, my brothers, when the children of Israel were in captivity and a decree was made for them to die, Mordecai sent message to Queen Esther but Queen Esther hesitated. And when Mordecai saw that the queen was hesitating, he sent a strong message uh, to, her, to her as recorded in Esther 4 verse 14. And I read, If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from another place. My dear brothers and sisters, God was telling Esther that I am not dependent on you if you don't do your work. I will still have my people delivered by other means. Yes, when the Pharisees came to Jesus as he was entering Jerusalem triumphant, they told him that tell your disciples to keep quiet. What did Jesus say in Luke 19 verse, 4, uh, verse 40? Jesus said, if these keep quiet, the stones 
will cry out. My dear brothers and sisters, God has always uh, partnered with human beings, though he is not dependent on them. If we fail to partner with God, he will accomplish with his work, with or without me. One day I was surprised. I was conducting an evangelistic campaign. One night, whereas I was preaching and making an altar call, we saw somebody who was drunk. He came staggering to where I was, and I did not know what he was going to do. And the deacons also were not sure. And so they came close in case there was going to be need to protect the preacher while he's on the pulpit. But this time around, the man, when he came closer to where I was, he put his hand in the pocket. And when he, I brought the hand out of the pocket, there was money in his hands. He says, I was going uh, drinking. But when I heard the voice, I said, I need to make a change. I had drunk enough and I must stop the money I should have used to drink beer or to buy beer. I am giving it to you so that you can run the campaign. God is not dependent on you. God is not dependent on me. He just he wants, he wants you and me to partner with him so that we share in the joy of salvation. Another reason why God loves cheerful givers is that those who give cheerfully, they give willingly. Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 12, eh, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable. My dear brother, dear sister, remember what Job said. When he lost everything, including his children, he said, naked came I into the world. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken. Let his name be praised. What about Paul? What did he say? Paul said, for surely we brought nothing into this world, and we shall take nothing out of it. When we came in this world, we came empty-handed. Everything that we have has been ours by the good hand of the Lord. And because everything belongs to him, we need to give back to him cheerfully. That is why God loves cheerful givers. Number four, cheerful givers give with the end in mind. Cheerful givers give with the end in mind. And I'm reminded of Isaiah 53 and reading verse 11. The Bible says, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. The Lord Jesus, even when he left heaven to come here on planet earth, his focus was not on what he was going to go through. He never focused on those who were going to reject him. He never focused on those who were going to spit upon him. He never focused on those who were going to slap him. He never focused on the soldiers who were going to thrust his side with his spears. No! He focused on the end. He saw the result of his work, and he was satisfied. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters, he saw you in heaven. He saw me in heaven. And because of that, he was satisfied. My dear brother and sister, when you are called upon to partner with God through your tithes and offerings, give cheerfully by focusing not on the present, but focus on the end. My dear brother, dear sister, today you and I are in the church. We are waiting for the second coming of Jesus. But little do we realize that we are what we are today because somebody somewhere I gave while we were still far away from God. One day when Jesus had come and everything that was hidden shall be known, then will we know the people who contributed to our salvation. My dear brothers and sisters, there's somebody waiting to shake your hand and say, thank you, my dear brother. Thank you, my dear sister. Had it not been for your giving, I would have not been here in heaven. Had it not been for the tithe you returned, I would not be standing here walking in the streets of gold. Had it not been for the offerings you gave, I would not be here sharing eternity with the saints of all ages. And therefore, my dear brother, dear sister, be a cheerful giver. But as you become a cheerful giver, do not focus on the present. Focus on the end. 
If you focus on the present, you will be discouraged. But when you focus on the end, you will be encouraged. Because there's somebody in America, there's somebody in India, there's somebody in Australia, there's somebody in the, in the, on, the on the Comoros Island, and there's somebody, somebody somewhere, even here on the Comoros there's somebody also somewhere, even here on the continent of Africa, who is going to congratulate you, who is going to say thank you to you because of your giving. And above all, Jesus will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in little things. I'll make you ruler over much. That is why God loves cheerful givers. They give cheerfully. They give willingly. They want to partner with God. They know who the ruler and the owner of everything is. Today, my dear brother, dear sister, I want to invite you to be a cheerful giver. Imagine with me what you would have been had it not been for God. Some of us, had it not been for God, we would have been buried and forgotten. Had it not been for God, some of us would be rotting in jails. Had it not been for God, some of us would be doing despicable things. But thank God, he came through somebody who gave tithe and offerings somewhere whom we do not know right now. And today, you are who you are. There's somebody somewhere who wants to share your story. There's somebody somewhere who wants also to rejoice in salvation and be ready for the coming of Jesus. But that can only be if you and I become cheerful givers. May you decide to be a cheerful giver. And with that decision, may God bless you and write your name in the book of life. Amen.